Okay, let us turn to page two. Page, sorry, page four. <clears throat> I go for refuge and tell my light and to the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. By my accumulations or practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to bend for all sentient beings. I go for refuge and tell my light and to the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. By my accumulations or practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to bend for all sentient beings. I go for refuge and tell my light and to the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. By my accumulations or practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to bend for all sentient beings. Sangye Juda Soge Jona Amda Janju Mardu Dane Gyabzu Che Tage Jin Soge Be Sonam Ge Sangye Juda Soge Jona Amda Janju Mardu Dane Gyabzu Che Tage Jin Soge Be Sonam Ge Dolo benjir sanje du parai shu sanje ju da soge cho nam na Chan ju pa du da ne gyap su chi ta ke chin so ke pe so nam ni Dolo benjir sanje du parai shu Next page, page number six Om ye dharma he tu prabhavam he tum te sham datha gato yavatat te sham chayo nirodha evam vati mahashramana yeswaha Om ye dharma he tu prabhavam he tum te sham datha gato yavatat te sham chayo nirodha evam vati mahashramana yeswaha Om ye dharma he tu prabhavam he tum te sham datha gato yavatat te sham chayo nirodha evam bhati mahashramana yeswaha Om ye dharma he tu prabhavam he tum te sham datha gato yavatat te sham chayo nirodha evam vati mahashramana yeswaha all phenomena arise from causes. The causes are taught by the Tathagata, the cessation of causes as well as taught by the Tehata Om Gati Gati Paragati Parasam Gati Bodhiswatiyata Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhisattva Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasangate Bodhisattva Okay, as I said earlier, um, uh, we have the Costa Rica. We have the team from Costa Rica, the Venerable Abbot here. And um, Carolina, who joined the early retreat, do you have some laying? Yes. And uh, you identify some of them? 
you identify some of them. Yeah. Okay. So welcome all from Costa Rica. So nice to meet you all here. Um, it's a great joy for me to have met the the member Albert and the women Dhamsala or Delhi at the airport. Dhamsala airport, yes. <clears throat> okay. So today the topic is Bodhicitta. And um, first of all, we need to, uh, the, again, uh, the, the Bodhicitta, why do we have to study, practice Bodhicitta? And then how to practice Bodhicitta? And the, the measure having, gen having generated Bodhicitta. For this matter, first let me the, share with you that the, uh, what we aspire to attain we all aspire to attain, uh, say, the fearlessness and infinite happiness. This is a basic uh, reality that everybody follows. Whatever the gender, whatever ethnicity, whatever religion they're following, um, we all are just common in uh, the wanting to get away from fears of life, in other words, stay away from miseries, and to have the maximum happiness. This is a reality. And uh, the, at the same time, the next question is that the, um, whether we can attain these two the goals, this is the next question. For that, the, um, say a handful of sand you squeeze, no matter how much you squeeze a handful of sand, no oil comes out. So for the oil to come out, so okay, say the... Um, handful of sunflower seeds, you squeeze it, and oil does come out. With a handful of sand, no matter how much you squeeze, no oil comes out. My question to you is, uh, what's the difference? Where lies the difference? Anyone? Quick, quick, to save time? Yes. Sand does not have the potential for oil, as well as the sunflower seeds have the potential for oil. Likewise, if we if we put effort, can we experience the infinite happiness? This is a question. So for that, the same reason applies, or the same logic applies. Do we have the potential for infinite happiness? This is the next question. So, on the answer is yes. We all have this potential for the infinite happiness, and we all have the potential to be free from all the fears of life, all the fears of samsara. This is reality. The next question is that the um, that what is that potential like within us? The potential to experience the infinite happiness. And so, what is that potential like? So, uh, I would say that in this book, the Blaze of non dual Bodhicittas, there's one section, um, the in praise of Dharma Dharma Dadu or Dharma Dadu Stava. What is it? Is there anybody who can help identify this text? Short text. What page is that? In praise of Dharma Dadu. 144. 90. Page 90. <clears throat> okay. Page 90. The text in praise of Dharma Dadu. This was, compo this was composed by Aryan Nagarjuna. And I would highly recommend all of us to study this in praise of Dharma Dadu. Um, I'm not going to read this. I'm just, just explaining, sharing with you that this text by Arya Nigarjuna is about your Buddha nature. Your Buddha nature. You have to see to perfection. You can become enlightened. You can experience infinite happiness. If you put effort, then you can experience the, uh, this infinite happiness. You can. So for this matter, uh, this is explained by the Indian great master, Arinagarjuna, like in the first century AD. It's first century AD. He composed this text. So this will tell us that we have the potential. And the one example given is that what Arinagarjuna taught here is that, say, 
the the true nature of mind. What is your the the the, the mind? What's the true nature like? That give that, uh, if you understand this, and this will give us the confidence that yes, my mind can experience infinite happiness, infinite ease, and infinite fulfillment. And the what is it like? Say the example given. This is so important. We have to rely on the examples. Uh, by with these examples, then you will build up your conviction that we have the potential for perfection. I have the potential for infinite happiness. So, what is that potential like? Uh, the same. Uh, the if I suggest you, if I suggest you to the you want to read a book and there is no light, it is totally dark. Then I said you go to room A and in there there is a light there. You go in there and then it's totally dark. You come back and say that, oh, I went there, but there's no light. I said, yes, there's a light. I know there's light there. And uh, yes, you said, no, it's totally dark. Did you see a vase there? Did you vaguely see a vase? I says, yes. And the light is inside the vase. So how do you know that? So let's see that our mind, how many of you... How many of you experience infinite happiness at the moment? Raise hands. How many experience infinite happiness? We don't experience that, right? So when we don't experience that, in that in that room, in that room, I said that there's a light there, but you did not see a light. You only saw you only saw vast there. Put some upside, upside down. So I said that light is inside this vase. So why the light is not visible was because it was blocked by the vase. So how do you know, you may ask me, how do you know that there's a light inside this vase? So what I tell you is that punch a hole, any direction of the vase, you punch a hole and see what happens. You punch a hole and the light from inside, from the hole, the light beams forth, right? Okay, so there's something there, there's light inside. And if you still want to know more, I really want to know how there's really light there. Then you break the vase. Break the vase, what happens? Then the light inside will just spread all directions. Everywhere in the room, the light will spread. So this is, say, we don't see the light. We don't see this infinite happiness at the moment within us. But it is there. But we don't feel it because that is covered by the vase. The light inside us is covered by the vase. So our job is once in a while, once in a while, some of you may feel that I'm very short, you know, you are short-tempered person. No, I don't, I could not really go along with other people so well. No, I don't really they understand my mom, right? So you, you have these problems there. But once in a while, you do feel the, the compassion. Once in a while, you do feel compassion. What is that like when you feel that compassion is so beautiful? And the last time, I asked you to raise your hand to share with us the, the beautiful, some of the beautiful moments in your life. When I asked you, for example, Minadiji sharing that when she was holding her son, the newborn son, and it's a beautiful moment, right? And who was that? that? Another one? And I think there was another one also who shared a similar experience here. Here, yes, the attention uh, seeing his holiness, you know, just holding her very big, amazingly smart daughter, guidance of her mom, who is extremely smart and mature, all the very little, very young. So that the mother feels so much of joy and happiness. Okay. So this is the, the beautiful moment. So in other words, that you feel something. And I said earlier that when I was there, the 2010, when the, my flight landed in Singapore, Singapore, that the, um, it must be my second time or third time there, but that time when it landed, there was incredibly beautiful moment. The, the moment in my mind, extremely beautiful. You cannot draw, describe that in words. Extremely beautiful. 
So why all these things happening is that we see that this coming, this beautiful moment coming inside, from inside. For some people watching the sunset, who was that? Sunset was, yes. And the say and with some people the music, right? Some Mozart music, maybe for Mark. Mozart music, right? Then there's something inside moving. You're getting something moving inside. And some of you maybe when Tinsila sings the Aritara Mantra, something's moving in many of us, right? So what I'm saying is that these beautiful moments, they're coming from where? Are they coming from outside or coming from inside? It's all coming from inside. It's the same object, but sometimes it happens, sometimes it does not happen, which means it's not purely from the object, it's something from inside. So the source is there, it's not visible all the time, but once in a while it comes out, which means that we punch a hole to this vase and, and this light from inside beams forth from that direction. Once in a while it comes out. Now if we break this vase completely, if we remove the mental deformance completely, then the, your mind will manifest its true nature. What's the true nature? To just spread so freely across the universe. That is when your mind doesn't feel any obstruction. Uh, the same, um, when you feel that, oh, I have a problem with this person, with my mom, with my dad, with my, the, say the, uh, with my boss, husband, wife, children, with neighbor, everywhere there's a problem. Once in a while it happens. How many, to how many it happens? Once in a while, everywhere there's a problem, right? Yes. So what do you feel? You feel so suffocated. You feel so suffocated. So that is the imprisonment. Imprisonment. When will these, when this is a mental imprisonment, there's no physical wall there, but mentally you imprison yourself by creating barrier with this person, that person, this person, that person, you create an imprisonment there. You create a prison, mental prison. And how do you dissolve this mental prison? When you feel the love and affection, then it's so beautiful inside. So that love and affection, if you can expand it, so why we don't feel that love and affection is because of the vase. Which vase? The vase of self and attitude and the vase of self-grasping ignorance. These are the two things which just suffocate our, the true nature of the mind. It entraps our true nature of the mind. So our job is to get rid of this vase, self and attitude, and you see how the mind behaves. Then the mind behaves in a very natural form. For example, say you are say they be bound by chain for ye for days months and years you feel so suffocated and so uncomfortable the moment you this is released you uh, the the chain is they uh, they, they what they released removed then you feel such a freedom this is exactly what happens to a mind how the mind behaves so our job is to uh, see the remove this barrier and let the mind flow freely. What do you mean by mind to flow, flow freely? So with examples of like what Minodi just said and then Shundala said, that when you feel this love and affection, then the mind flows freely. So if you can let your mind flow, of course, let's say the first theoretically speaking, if you let your mind flow freely towards all the sentient beings, then the, how many centimeters are there? The infinite centimeters are there. There's an infinite joy coming in you. If your mind uh, freely flow towards your sun, it's one, one joy. If it freely flows towards ten, ten joys. If it freely flows towards the infinite beings, then infinite joys. You're getting it? Okay. So this, we can talk of it theoretically at the moment, but if you practice it, you will see it's real. It's not just theory, it's real. Okay, the next point is that, oh yes, okay, how many of you would agree with me that yes, intellectually I can understand it, that if my mind flows freely towards all the beings, my compassion, love and affection towards all the beings, infinite beings, then I would have infinite happiness that I can imagine. Resents? Good. What would the next question? Okay. Okay, now you're good at saying this how, right? 
Okay, when you say how, it's not your responsibility, responsibility here, right? So how? Okay, how? Or is it really possible? Is it really, in the first place, is it really possible that my mind can flow freely towards all the beings? Is it possible, this is a question, right? If the answer is yes, then you will ask, how? Okay, is it possible, this is a question. So the answer is, yes, of course it is possible, right? Charles Darwin, on the contrary, Charles, Dar Charles Darwin's evolutionary theory says, no, it is not possible. Because for Charles Darwin, our basic emotions, such as attachment, aversion, fear, these Charles Darwin call as instincts, number one, instincts. Number two, he, he argues that these emotions are required for your survival. If these emotions are not there, the human species cannot survive. Why? One, attachment. Attachment is what? Attachment is the, say, the emotion within us to gather the conducive factors required for your survival. For example, if you're not attached to food, then you will not care to eat food. You'll not care to eat food. For example, like when you when you when your body needs water, you'll feel thirsty. You're getting it? When you take a lot of salt, salt is actually not good for your health. Too much of salt is not good for your health. So when you take a lot of salt, you tend to feel very thirsty. Because to neutralize the salt, we require the water. So you feel thirsty. These are the natural, say the mechanisms. So the attachment is required. This is Charles Evans' position. Attachment is required for you to gather the conducive factors for your survival. Anger, aversion is required to push aside the non-conducive factors for your survival. Fear is required. If you don't have the fear, a tiger comes, and then you don't have fear, you stay there, and the tiger will just pounce on you and eat you up. Finish. So your species will terminate. So therefore, these emotions are, number one, instinct. Instinct means that you can do away from this. 2008, I think. Um, the Office of His Holiness the Dalai Lama sent me to America to work on His Holiness's book. I think some of you must have read this book, Emotional Awareness by Professor Paul Eggman. Uh, no, by His Holiness and Professor Paul Eggman jointly um, wrote the book or the it was like the result of the 40 I think 52 hours of interview which Professor Paul Eggman conducted uh, conducted to his holiness the Dalai Lama and they it came out into one book emotional awareness and the, the office of his holiness sent me there to make sure that this book his holiness's voice is intact is not the um, the wrong so I was there for five days with him, Professor Paul Eggman, who was a legend, he's a, who is a world-renowned other psychologist who works on the microfacial expression reading. Microfacial expression reading, he's an expert on this. He's like a pioneer of this science. And the, um, he entertained me for all these five evenings. And one evening, he called all his psychology psychologists um, the friends, and he asked me to introduce myself. Then I talked a little bit about, say, the how in Buddhist psychology, uh, the emotions are tackled to get rid of all the destructive emotions, attachment, anger, fear, and so forth. And one lady psychologist raised her hand and said that, but these emotions cannot be gone rid of. These are instincts, according to Charles Darwin's evolutionary theory. These are instincts. You cannot get rid of these. Number one. And also, the, not, not, not only that they are instincts, they are also the evolved. These are like, a, say, the evolutionary gifts for us. Evolutionary gifts. They evolved over the span of like 0.3 million years. 0.3 million years, it evolved. And the, uh, because of this, that the, um, these emotions, they, they are required. And this is Charles Darwin's evolution theory. Then whereas, and the Buddha taught very differently. Buddha taught that no, these emotions, if these emotions cannot be gone rid of, then anger. So how many of us 
right, the, the morning you get up and you say that, oh, I'm to, today I'm so excited, I'm going to be angry today. Nobody would feel that. Because with anger, there's a disturbance then. Only when you are and you, only when you are in the grip of the anger, then you lose the sanity. Then you may invigorate the anger. Otherwise, when you calm, nobody wants to be angry. So, with the anger, disturbance happens. Whereas, we talk about the infinite happiness with no disturbance. So, Buddha said that, yes, anger is not required. Not required. Whereas, Charles Darwin said, that anger is required, attachment is required, fear is required. With fear, nobody is happy. It's acutely disturbing mental state. In fact, if you are to live in fear, continue this for acute fear for about one month, you will die very soon. You will die very soon. Because our body cannot contain this fear. It can just destroy your immunity drastically and finish. You will be finished off just within a, the if not within week, months, for sure within, uh, if not within weeks, I would say within months, you will be finished off by the anchor, by the, I uh, say the fear. So, the point is that the uh, Buddha taught, no, this can be gone at all. We don't require these emotions for our survival. What we need is, we have the, the it's not just the, the, say, the instincts. We have something deeper than the instincts. We have the natural potential for compassion. And that too, not just a compassion, but a skillful compassion. Skillful compassion. Skillful compassion will do to get all the conditions factors. Two, skillful compassion will get rid of all the non conditions factors. Skillful compassion will get will make you run away from the fears of life like from the tiger from the lions and so forth where you have the skillful compassion all the factors required for your survival can be fulfilled we don't have to rely on attachment fear and uh, the aversion so therefore as per buddha we don't require these basic emotions are the instincts according to buddhism Answers yes, their instincts. Um, can we get rid of them? We can get rid of them. Do we need them? We don't need them. They destroy our peace of mind. And excessive attachment can destroy peace of mind. Aversion can destroy peace of mind. Fear can destroy your immunity. So we don't require them. Even without them, we can survive if extremely effectively. That is what helps us. Skillful compassion. How to cultivate the skill? What, what is meant by skillful compassion? The highest of which is the compassion which you feel towards all the beings. So the, back to the question, back to the first original question is, can we cultivate such a universal compassion towards all the beings? This is the first question. If the answer is yes, then the next question is how? Okay, so for this answer is yes. And this text, Dharma Dadustava, we read them, study them, we'll be inspired to see that, wow, this is amazing, this is an incredibly great gem for us, that in our life, this is so meaningful. Okay, with this in mind, this treasure inside us, an example given is that, say you are in a very simple hut, simple hut, and under, under, underneath your floor, you say, otherwise you are a you are begging for your food. You don't have anything underneath the floor. There's a treasure, huge, massive treasure there, like 10 kg gold, 10 kg diamond there. But Arjuna Nagarjan said that as long as you, you don't discover that treasure underneath, you remain a beggar. The moment you discover that, you are no more a beggar. Perhaps you may be the richest person on the earth or in your country. So, it is there, but it's a matter of you discover it or not. If you discover it, you're not a beggar. You're not a beggar anymore. Likewise, you're suffering terribly bad in samsara. If you uncover this treasure, Buddha nature within us, we are no more samsaric beings. Okay, page what? Nine zero. Okay, page nine zero. If you read, um, Okay, I'll just 
be slowly read them and see if you if you understand they it makes some sense to us in praise to in praise of dharma dadu by arnegar dharma dadu meaning the buddha nature within us i pay homage to the youthful aramanju stream i bow to the dharma dadu which resides in every sentient being everyone has this but if they are not aware of it they circle through the through realms if you don't if you're not aware of the presence of this dharma dadu buddha nature within us we continue to suffer in samsara number 2 due to just that being purified what is such samsara's cause what otherwise we remain samsari cause if you purify that when you remove smash the the vase this very purity is then nirvana like was dharmakaya is just this while it is blended with milk butter's essence appears not likewise in the afflictions makes dharma dadu is not seen once you have cleansed it from the milk butter's essence is without a stain just as with the afflictions purified the dharma dadu becomes stainless just as a lamp that is sitting inside a vase doesn't illuminate at all while dwelling in the vase of the afflictions the dharma dadu is not seen from whichever of his sides you punch some holes into the vase from just these various places then its light rays will beam forth once the vajra of samadhi has completely smashed this vase to the very limits of all space it will shine just everywhere okay so you can read on and on this is extremely precious text so now next is wow if this is my true nature my mind where if i remove this if i remove this for example let's say uh, the uh, say a light a, a light and there's a piece of stone they are both in dark dark room no light the, the the dark room and in one there are two vases one vase in it there's a light one vase there's a piece of stone right so if you if you smash the, the two vases which of them will shine everywhere than the one with the light not one with the stone why with the stone does not have that quality even if it is free it will it it doesn't have the quality to spread but it's just light when trapped in the vase you smash it instantly it behave in its true nature that is it spreads like was our mind is like the light not like the stone at the moment it is covered under the 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 picture the vase of the mental defilements once you remove them self grasping in self centered when you remove them then our mind will behave in its true nature that is it spreads to the minds of every sentient being it spreads to every atom of the universe this is when you are referred to as the omniscient one ever present omnipresent and omniscient and omnipotent this is what your mind is this true nature of mind so how to how to make it manifest the first the what we see is that one thing is that this feeling of love and affection this is the, the this is what makes our mind to flow you yes we said that oh okay let's say i feel close to changjula i my mind feel close to changjula what does it mean by that that the affection is built up the affection is built up with the affection you your mind moves to us so this is in english language we say i feel close to in tibetan sem sem da nyebo nyebo is close so we see that the feel close okay so here wow this is amazing where i have difficulty with this person that person this person this person suddenly so, suddenly somebody comes who is extremely nice to you you are so so loving the person comes you feel instantly what do you feel huh you feel so relaxed you feel so much at ease you getting it okay so the secret of the happiness lies in letting your mind to behave in its true nature not confine it in the prison right what Create a prison, anger, ego. They create a prison. How? They make you not comfortable with other people. So it makes us area very small. That is prison. It's the imprison of one's own mind. So how do you let go of this by expanding this compassion towards others, right? So what would be a question to me? What would be a question to me? No, you have to practice compassion. Practice compassion to all beings. What question? 
No, I said you have to practice compassion. Spread it. Practice compassion. Huh? Huh? I d i f f e r no practice it because I say the uh, to do PhD is not that easy. Keep studying. Keep studying. Right. Keep practicing it. Then. Oh, that after after few years you will come to know. For time you have to do. What question? What next question? Huh? No, practice it. Huh? What measure? If the measure will come later. Huh? Okay. Point is that what is the mechanism? If you don't know the mechanism, say for example, okay, if I follow you, right? Just to practice. What should I practice, right? What should I practice? Should I sit like this, right? Just sit like this. Even the rabbits do that. Even the rabbits do that. Sit like this. But how can we guarantee the compassion grows sitting like this? It's purely cognitive activation of mind. Cognitive activation of mind. How to then activate the mind cognitively? For this, first we need to gain conviction in this. How to gain conviction? How to gain conviction? For this, we have to study. You're getting it, okay? Now, in your life, have you seen what is the most common? So, what we said thus far, from what what I've said thus far, how many agree with me? At least intellectually, may not be experientially. At least intellectually, how many agree with me? That yes, if I feel this, the say compassion towards all the beings, or love and affection towards all the beings, then my mind will really feel at ease. Raise hands, at least intellectually. Okay, because when I see the the mother and the child, the love is so beautiful. The child feels, they say in the school, the child is so suffocated, bullied by elder other children. So suffocated. The moment the child comes home, is the boss of the home, right? Child, when you <laughs> come home, oftentimes you are the boss, right? At school, you are subjugated. At home, you feel that you are the tiger of the home, right? Because you feel this love and affection from your from your parents is so beautiful. My question to you is that in your life. With your, be it your own experience or through you, what you see, tell me. Where do you find this beautiful love and affection most commonly? Raise hands, quick, 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 quick. Because we want to learn this. We want to learn this feeling of love and affection. We want to expand this love and affection to all the beings. For this, we need role. For this, we need examples. Raise hands. Okay, Sumanji. Louder. Between mother and child, how many agree with Suman Jiri's hands? Good. Okay. Now, between the mother and the child, between mother and child, say the mother's love towards the child, then the child's love towards the mother. Yes, right. Child's love towards the mother. Mother's love towards the child. Child, not at the age of sixteen. Not the age of six; it's very complicated age. Age five, six, seven, eight is so beautiful. It's so beautiful. You're gonna get age four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, then <laughs> eleven revolution starts, right? Till this age is so beautiful. It's amazingly beautiful, right? Okay, now. If you, I really want to cultivate this love towards all the beings. Your question is how? So for this, I need to have examples, and the best example that I can see is the common example that I see is the mother and a very tender young child love between the two, and which love? The mother's love towards child, or the child love towards them? both? Both are beautiful, both are amazingly beautiful, right? So the next is that okay, the mother's love towards the child. Can I mimic this? Can can I emulate this? This is a question. Mother's love. I can't really. The child's love towards the mother. Can I mimic this? Okay, this is something that we need to think of, because the child, day one the child was born, 
the day one child was born does she or he did she or he hug the mother saying thank you for giving birth huh no day one the child was born the child never hugged the mother never thanked the mother for the child the no who are you right but some people may say that some people may say that some neuroscientists also some people may say oh no even as a child is a mother's womb they feel that to be very honest uh, the that connection that the child feels is so 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 minuscule minuscule because the brain is not developed yet you're getting it brain is not developed yet at one day the child was born it takes like two years, three years, four years to develop this sophisticated brain to feel this enormous love towards the mother. It takes time. So, the day one, that child did not demonstrate any love and affection towards the mother. And how many of you feel this unconditional love towards all the beings? Raise hands. No one, right? So, you are like the child, day one, the child was born. You are like, we, we are all like the the child, day one the child is born, showing no love towards the mother. We don't feel love towards all the beings now. So we are same. You agree? Okay. With a span of like two years, three years, the child developed enormous love towards the mother. Yes? Yes. What is that mechanism? Raise your hand. Why this child developed over the years, two, three years time, the child develops enormous love towards the mother. And if you see, if you see that, I'm sure you must have behaved that way yourself. Say when you were age four or five, you will see the prospect of the mother leaving you. The mother having to leave you, having to go for some work, job for like two or three days. Then the even just for a few hours, you cannot. You cannot bear the pain, right? Then you scream, seeing that you're going to be separate from the mother for the next few hours or few days. Raise hands. Who did that? Raise hands. All of us, we had that experience, including myself, right? We had that experience. How come that you develop from zero love towards the mother to intense love towards the mother? How come that you develop this intense love over the span of two or three, four, five years? How come? Quake, the girl there. How? How, how, how? Yes. The, the, the child could feel the kindness of the mother. Anybody else would like to add? Kindness like what? Yes, the girl over there. That, that this child sees the mother as a source of benefit. You are a little hungry, <laughs> frowning face, mother comes to feed you. You are a little cold, the mother would put, put, put a hat and get, put a jacket. And then when you cry, the mother comes to pick you up, right? And then they say, you accidentally put your hand on the fire, <laughs> then you scream, the mother comes to pick you up and do something like this. Wherever you have a problem, somebody comes there. Somebody comes there, and that is your mother. So you see that as a source of benefit. When you see somebody as a source of benefit, your mind is automatically go close to the source of benefit. You're getting it? So that is your mind becomes closer to a source of benefit. Feeling close. What is the English word? What is that word? Feeling close. What, what does it mean by that? I feel close to you. Meaning? I feel affection. This is meaning of affection. For example, in South India, in Bangalore. Anyone from Bangalore? Anyone from Bangalore? No one. Okay. Um, Bangalore, I used to go to give teachings in one center there. And they, close by the center, there's one of uh, the Tibetan hostel. And the director is my friend. And the director's little girl, who must be aged four or five. And she knows that whenever this monk comes, she gets chocolates. She knows that. And her father told her that, oh, Gishila's coming. Right? And she's very smart. 
So when I was giving teaching, and then the director came in between, in the middle of the class, he came, and the little girl was also there. During the break time, the director came to see me, and the girl, knowing that, Gisela has brought chocolates for her, right? But she wa don't want to give the impression that she came just for the chocolate. So what she did, she, she was moving here, there, moving here, there. If I say, come, she'll run away, right? I have to pretend as well I'm not seeing him. And she comes like this, like this, like this, come closer, 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 closer towards me. If I say, hey, instantly she'll run away, right? So let her feel that she will do it in such a the, say, the way that people do not notice that she came here for the chocolate. As well as she came here just to play. And then finally she made herself so comfortable with me. And then I take up my chocolate and say, hey, this is your chocolate. And she takes it and she disappears. You're getting it? So why she is coming closer, closer, closer to, to, to this man? Why? Because she knows that there, this is a source of chocolate. So where the source of benefit is there, your mind feels close. You're getting it? So this child, over the span of two or three years' time, how this child developed intense love and affection with the mother is because the child feels that this is a source of benefit. You're getting it? This is a mechanism of developing, cultivating compassion towards others. If that is the case, then how can I see all beings? Our job is to... Feel this universal compassion towards all the beings. Universal feeling of closeness, feeling of love and affection towards all the beings. How can I feel that? How can I cultivate this? For this, by the same mechanism, by the same mechanism, we can cultivate it. We learn how to see the benefit that we get from all the beings. If, can, if we can think of the benefit that we're getting from all the beings, then... Okay, how many agree with me that if I can see the benefit that I get from all the beings, my mind will automatically feel close to us all the beings. Raise hands. If. Good. What's your question? What, what how? What how? How can I see that everyone is a source of benefit for me? How? This next question. So for this, everyone, even, I even don't know who everyone is, right? Forget about the benefit of the beings. I don't know who, they, forget about all sentient beings. I don't even know how many people here in Bodh Gaya, right? How many animals, creatures are there on, uh, here in Bodh Gaya? How can I think of the benefit of all the beings? Okay, for this we don't worry at all. All the beings, not only in Bodh Gaya, all the beings in the universe. We can be human beings, non-humans. We can group them into three categories. Near and dear ones, difficult people. Sorry, near and dear ones, the neutral beings, and the difficult people. You agree? We cannot imagine any being in this universe who does not fall under one of the three groups. Near and dear ones, neutral beings, and the difficult people. Yes? Yes? Good. Okay, now once we know this, once we know that, okay, all the beings can be grouped in these three categories. Then if you can feel the benefit from these three categories, that suffices seeing the benefit that we're getting from all the beings. You're getting it? It makes sense? It makes sense? If we can think of the benefit that we get from the three kinds of beings, near and dear ones, neutral beings, and the difficult people, then that suffices meditating on the benefit that we get from all the beings. Because no, there's no one who does not fall under one of the three, these three categories. You agree? Good. In this connection, so that, let's not forget the main point. So what we what we are trying to do here is that we are talking about how to see the benefit that we get from the three classes of beings. In other words, from all the beings in the form of three classes of beings. So this is our main job. Don't forget it. Now with this connection, let me take you back to the, the original point. That is the bodhicitta. The bodhicitta was, of course, originally taught by the Buddha Shakyamuni himself. The Buddha taught this. 
and then the um, the Buddha taught primarily uh, the okay so because they eat, you require a little bit of factual things um, the okay that's fine Buddha taught bodhicitta and the bodhicitta how to cultivate this bodhicitta the Buddha taught two main methods to generate bodhicitta the two main methods one is known as the sevenfold cause effect method to generate bodhicitta. Let me repeat it. The first one is sevenfold cause effect method. Sevenfold, F O L D. Sevenfold cause effect method to generate bodhicitta. And number two is. Siddhula. Siddhula. Number one is sevenfold cause of method to generate. Then the, the second one is the method of equalizing and exchanging self for others. The method of equalizing and exchanging self for others to generate bodhicitta. These are two main methods taught by the Buddha. And the first one, sevenfold cause effect method, the Buddha taught and the instruction was passed down to Arya Maitreya. Arya Maitreya. Arya Maitreya. You see here, Arya Maitreya. Where? Oh, yes. Okay, Arya Maitreya there. And any painting here? Yes, over there. Arimetria, also referred to as the future Buddha. Yes, over there. Yes. Thank you. Okay, Tenzinla, Pinzoli, thank you. Arimetria, just outside, the, when we you know, enter, we have the audience of Arimetria here. So, the first method, method, the sevenfold cause effect method, taught by the Buddha, passed down to Arimetria. Arimetria to Arya Sangha. And there are so many beautiful anecdotes we must learn from this, but we have, don't have time. Because of this, I cannot share all these things. Arya Sangha, particularly how Arya Sangha I say the um, invoked. Invoked. And the how Arya Sangha I say the meditated to have the uh, the technically refers to communion. Communion with Arimetria. 12 years Arya Sangha struggled. Then the um, from Arya Sangha to his younger brother Acharya Vazubandhu and then down on the line many teachers in between and finally in, 11, in 11th century AD uh, Lama Selingpa from Indonesia. Lama Selingpa in Indonesia and then Lama Selingpa to Lama Atisha. Lama Adisha was Indian, Lama Selingba was Indonesian. Both were the princes. Both were princes. And the, then the Lama Adisha brought this to Tibet. And from Tibet, we passed down to all the, the, the great teachers of Sakya, Kaigyu, Nyingma, Gelo, all these great teachers, they inherited uh, these teachings. And finally, today we have His Holiness the Dalai Lama who received all these teachings, and then what we get now is from His Holiness. Okay, so this is the one lineage, one lineage of the the method of sevenfold cause effect method to generate bodhicitta. The second method, method of equalizing and ex exchanging itself for others, that was again taught by the Buddha Shakyamuni, passed down to Arya Manjushri. Where is Arya Manjushri? Over there, where? Okay, okay, good. Arimanjushri, the Bodhisattva of wisdom. Then for Arimanjushri, down to Arinagarjuna. Arinagarjuna, down to Arya, the Bodhisattva Aridiva. And down the line, many teachers. And finally, 8th century great Indian master, Bodhisattva Shanti Deva, 
8th century great name out of Bursa Shantideva. From there down the line, again several teachers. Then 11th century, Lama Selingpa, Lama Adisha. So Lama Selingpa, Lama Adisha, these two are considered as the, the points of confluence of the two traditions. These two teachers are seen as the points of confluence of the two traditions of the Bodhicitta practices. Okay. So, on the of the two methods, Today, I will do the, the second method, method of equalizing and exchange yourself for others. Okay. And the first method, if you do get time, I'll be happy to do that. If you do not get time, then they say, if you're interested, is available in various sources. Um, okay. So the second method, the second method has nine steps the second method has nine steps second method has nine steps i like to enumerate what they are one equalizing self and others equalizing self and others equalizing self and self and others number two Reflecting on the demerits of cherishing oneself. Reflecting on the demerits of cherishing oneself. Number three, reflecting on the merits of cherishing others. Number four, taking the suffering of others with emphasis on compassion. Number five, giving your happiness to others with emphasis on loving kindness. Number six, Actual exchange of self and others. Number seven, special recollection of the kindness of others. Number eight, altruism. Number nine, bodhicitta. Okay, the anyone who likes me to repeat, raise hands. Okay, let me repeat it. First, equalizing self and others. Equalizing self and others. Equalizing self and others. Number two, reflecting on the demerits of cherishing oneself. Reflecting on the demerits of cherishing oneself. Number two. Number three, reflecting on the merits of cherishing others. Reflecting on the merits of cherishing others. Number three. Number four and five combined together is known as Tonglen practice in Tibetan. Tonglen practice. Number four is taking the suffering of others with emphasis on compassion. Number four, taking the suffering of others with emphasis on compassion. Number four, taking the suffering of others with emphasis on compassion. Number five, giving your happiness to others with emphasis on loving kindness. Number five, Giving a happiness to others with emphasis on loving kindness. Number six, actual exchange of self and others. Number six, actual exchange of self and others. Number seven, special recollection of the kindness of others. Special recollection of the kindness of others. Number eight, altruism. Number nine, bodhicitta. Number eight, altruism. Number nine, bodhicitta. Number one, equalizing self and others. Number two, reflecting on the demerits of cherishing oneself. Number three, reflecting on the merits of cherishing others. Number four, taking the suffering of others with emphasis on loving or compassion. Number five, giving happiness to others with emphasis on loving kindness. Number six, actual exchange of uh, self and others. Number seven, special recollection of the kindness of others. Number eight, altruism. Number nine, bodhicitta. Okay, done. Good. Okay, one. Verse number one. Equalizing self and others. So the point is that we need to all these tabs, all these tabs. Say, it's not that you you have to practice, practice. You have to know how to practice them. And some say, no, no practice the tonglen directly. It's also not good. You can do the tonglen practice. Provided the first three steps precedes. With the first three steps preceding, 
your tolerant practice, then it will become very effective. Otherwise, it can take, a, take us into burnout situation. We, we can have a complicated situation. It may make you actually leave the Dharma practice altogether. It's very dangerous. So first one is equalizing certain others. So these steps, they, I would suggest that, I would suggest all of us not to skip the steps. If you want to, if you're very serious in cultivating compassion, bodhicitta, then I would suggest you not to skip the steps. And they, one time, we did the first retreat 2012, I think. And there was one participant. After a few months, I received a message from the participant saying that, Gishala, I know all the steps. Can I now skip these this, this, this steps? Then I said, it's up to you. I personally practiced it the last like, over 20 years and still I'm following these steps. All the steps. And if maybe you are a special one, right? You can skip. I don't know. But I don't skip. So the point is that it's not about how much you know. It's about how much you experience. These are very different. You have to know this and then experience it. For this, we have to follow the steps. It's not about whether you know this or not. So we have to follow the steps. First, equalize yourself and others. And each of these steps, we must be convinced. If you're not convinced, you have to discuss with your, uh, the, discuss with your colleagues, with your friends, with the Dharma teachers. You have to read books, standard books. The, um, the point is that we must be convinced. Equalizing self and others. Meaning that they, they, so we cannot jump to say that others are more important than me. I'll take care of you more than myself. We cannot do that because we are born selfish. You agree? Some of you may not agree, right? If you don't agree, listen to this. Day one you are born, how many of you must have cried? Resents. Day one you are born, how many of you must have cried? Why did you cry? Why, I'm not asking why did you cry. You, you'll not remember that. But I'll ask you, what must be the reason that made you cry? What must be the reason? Is it because that, oh, the other baby is not being fed? Other baby must be feeling cold. Please, you know, help her, help him. No, it's not because of that. I'm feeling cold. I'm feeling hungry. Somebody slapped me, right? I am feeling the pain. I, I, I. What is this? This is selfishness. We are born with, there's a selfishness inside us. Don't feel shy to say that there's an element of selfishness within me. Because of this, we require Dharma practice. If there's no element of selfishness, why do we have to practice Dharma practice? Why do we have to go for Dharma practice? So, the, it is there. Because of this practice, we'll put effort to get rid of this and then we experience the infinite compassion because of which we experience the infinite happiness. This is the whole the goal, whole purpose of the practice. So with this in mind, the first step, don't jump up there. If you want to climb the, the roof, don't jump there. First take the first step. Second, there are steps there. The first step to say that we are equal, right? Say our natural tendency is that we are most we are selfish and don't feel shy. And how do you know that? Right? Say when the airplane stop when the airplane lands, right? Gaya airport, airplane lands, dig 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 right? Then what happens? Right? Everybody is alert. Then what happens? Then the bell rings, ding, which means now the passengers can stand up and take your bags. Everybody stands up, right? And if somebody cuts you, right, comes before you, you'll stay this person, right? You'll stay the person. Why? You want to get first, get up first, right? And where do you end up? You end up in the baggage claim. In the baggage claim, everyone, again, everything is there. Not that you are first. Your baggage may come last. You're getting it? But the, our, human, our, our instinct is such that when the aeroplane lands and the bell rings and somebody just gets up, you also, you also feel little you, is that I have to also get up. Right? So these are clear indications that deep inside us there's a selfishness there. You're getting it? These are the instincts. So likewise, same during the Russian Revolution, French Revolution, 
revolution there when people like a shortage of food when the bread right somebody selling bread everybody is going to grab at the bread you're getting it and most likely most likely not always the case most likely the people who grab the 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 bread they're not saying that oh the other person is not getting bread i am not getting bread you're getting it this is the say when it comes to the acute yes it's extremely painful this selfishness actually is the one which creates pain in us this is reality so the point is that first let's see that okay the first to, let us tone down the selfishness how to say that oh it's not that you are more important but we are same i'm not more important we are same equalizing self and others so how okay if i ask you right we're all extremely hungry and then somebody brings a bread and says who has had this bread what do you say if you, we are all extremely hungry hunger for the last no food for the last 5 days who has had the bread be very honest i'll have it and i i ask you okay i'll give this bread to you provided you give me a good reason why should i give this bread to you what's your hey this is shanzumla why should i give this bread to you this is shanzumla yes <laughs> then she wants to think about other sentient beings right so she's okay so we're all very hungry right all very hungry hunger no food for the last five days extremely hungry, acute hungry then suddenly i came with the bread and you, who's going to have it everybody say i'll have it i'll have it then i asked then she says why do you want to have it? if you give me a good reason i'll give it to you what reason will you give no she doesn't have a reason which is thing of all the beings anyone else hey jimela tell me yeah, you will say that oh please give it give the bread to me why give me a good reason okay anyone else yes the girl there your name huh nif Huh? Are you sure? Okay. Okay, if it's a small bread, still you say I'll have it, I'll have it, right? Why you? If you give me a good reason. But the reason should be genuine. Not that I'll share with others, I give it and you eat everything, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Okay, why? Anyone why? Yes, Victoria. Because I'm hungry. This is a genuine answer. You're going to I'm hungry. My question to you is all others say equal hungry. You will say yes, <laughs> right? So this is not the this is not the reason only applicable to me here. I'm hungry. You're going to get So look. You see that this is the only reason. I'm hungry. I'm in pain. I have the pain of hunger. You're getting it? so we are all equal in not wanting hunger so equalizing self and others why because we are all equal in wanting happiness and not wanting suffering this is reality if you think of this more and more then gradually our selfishness will tone will be toned down you're getting it toned down this is the we have to reflect on this just to know this intellectually will not really help you have to know know this and think about this more the more you think about this gradually your say the the intensity of thing anger will subside and in the family so not necessary frictions are happening in the family right so when you go out husband and wife hands holding hands the moment inside house finish right <laughs> and and then conflicts happen right so whereas if you know that oh, the other person also has a problem other person also doesn't want suffering other also also wants happiness if you think of this more then your family harmony will build up you're getting it your understanding will build up you become a happier person your life will become way more easy understanding will come if you think of only from your perspective only from your perspective let's i'll give an example let's say that 
Okay. <laughs> That's an interesting anecdote. I forgot it. Okay, let's say that, let's say that, okay, they, the husband and wife conversation, right? So the wife tells the husband, okay, when I breathe, I breathe like, I say what, breathe in and out, is like uh, the, uh, okay, in, in like, I say five minutes, breathing in and out, in and out as counted counted as one cycle. Uh, breathe like let's say are they what? Let's say um say, say like forty. Okay, let's say what? Okay, so let's say normal is fourteen. Let's say normal is normal one is fourteen. Normal one is fourteen. And you said you you know you may said it fourteen. And the other, your husband or your wife heard it as 40. 40. So therefore, we have to say 40 to avoid this, uh, the potential mishearing. 40 or 14, right? So 14. And the other person out, it's 40, right? So because you are husband and wife, so there's a sense of concern. And look at this concern. It's 40. Yeah. Oh, this is very serious. You have to go to hospital, right? No, why should I go to hospital? It's 40. No, I said 14. You said 40. You're getting it? No, I said 14. No, you said 40, <laughs> right? So, why are you, why are you fighting? Why are you fighting? Concern, this concern. Why are you concern? Love. It is not love now. You're fighting. You're getting it? If it's a genuine affection, if it's a genuine concern, then, oh, it's 14, one, four. It's not four, zero. I'm so happy. Thank you. You hug. Instead of that, you said 40. No, I said just 14. No, no, you said 40. I can, I'm not deaf. <laughs> you are getting it? And escalates. This is what oftentimes happens between husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriends. You're getting it? This is a problem. This is the clear indication is there's an element of selfishness there. If it's genuine compassion, you should feel happy instead of fighting. That I'm so glad it's not 4 0, it's 1 4, right? It's 1 4. I'm so happy, thank you, that you are physically healthy. I'm so glad, thank you. You give hug. Instead of, you said 40. Meanwhile, the temperature shoots up, your blood pressure goes up. And then you really have to go to hospital. <laughs> You're getting it. So this happens. So look. So these are the real things, real life experiences. So what I'm saying is that, that we're all equal in wanting happiness, not wanting suffering, equalization, equalizing self and others. Number two, very important thing is that why, say 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, why a child referred to as a prince, son of a King is considered as very important. Even the wisest of the ministers have to respect this little boy. Why? Anyone? Raise your hand. Yes. Because he is the next to the throne, meaning that, that he's going to become the king in the future. You're getting it? Who is more important? The one who's going to become king? The king is more important or the Buddha is more important? Far, far, far. There's no comparison at all. Becoming king and becoming Buddha. Buddha is way, 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 way more important. You're getting it? If somebody who's going to become a king is to be treated as so special and important, somebody who's going to become Buddha, Buddha should be treated even more as more important thing. And who is that? All other sentient beings. We're all equal in having the seed of Buddhahood, seed of Buddha nature. We're all equal. So, therefore, everybody should be treated as very special. Not that I'm more special than you. I'm more important than you. This should not happen. Because everybody has a seed of Buddhahood, a seed of perfection. So, reflection on these points more and more is extremely beautiful. Sometimes say that you come across a person who is extremely complicated, very judgmental. The moment you see the person, instantly you feel so suffocated. Does it happen once in a while? 
be very honest, raise hands. If it does happen sometimes, very judgmental, then say, this person is judgmental, right? When you see this, you are judgmental. This person is very judgmental. You are judgmental. You are getting it? So the, the poor person, she said, you are also judgmental. So this is a problem. Whereas if you think of, if you think that, oh, this person, yes, of course, he's so judgmental. She's very judgmental. But he also has a Buddha nature. If the, the, the picture, if this picture, the vase, is broken in his heart, then his light will be formed with enormous affection towards all the beings, including me. Right? He will not take me out. He will embrace me. She will embrace me with total love and affection if the mental defilements are gone. So the mental defilements, like the fact that he's being judgmental, this is not his true nature. You're getting his true nature so beautiful. If you think in this line, and, and that too, if you're convinced about the Buddha nature, and this person also has a Buddha nature, you remove metal, imagine that metal defilements are removed, then the person will just come to embrace you where the mother does to you when you were just two years old, three years old, four years old. When you were just one day old, five, five days old. You do not know how to speak. You do not know the language. But the mother, knowing that you cannot speak, still the, still the mother talks to you. Right? And other people may think that, the, that, that, that this lady is crazy. Right? Talking to you know, somebody who doesn't know how to talk. Talking to somebody who doesn't know anything, what you're talking. But she's talking. Why? It's all out of love. This is how this person will behave towards me. If the mental deformities are gone. If the true nature of this person manifests, the person will not kick me out. The person will include me, embrace with me, total love and affection. If you think of this more and more, your mind will stop to become judgmental. This is so beautiful practice. You're getting it? This is. Then the next is what? This is step one. Method of equalizing and exchange yourself for others. No, the first one is equalizing self and others. What is step two? Reflecting on the demerits of cherishing oneself. And step three, reflecting on the merits of cherishing others. Okay, this, these two are so important. Finally, what attracts all the miseries is this self-centered attitude. Let me repeat it. What attracts all the miseries is self and attitude, and what attracts all the happiness is other cherished mind. And this, we need to know the, we need to so learn from the various anecdotes, incidents, what you've read, what you've seen, what you've experienced. Bring them here in this meditation. Bodhijitta meditation, one can be as creative. We can bring the information, whatever. For the emptiness meditation, don't be too creative. You can go off the track very easily. For the bodhisattva meditation, you can be as creative. There's no danger. As long as you bring the facts, factual incidents, not just uh, cooked up stories. You're going to get... So, for example, like, look at the demerits of cherishing oneself. Reflection on the demerits of cherishing oneself is so, so... In a family, in a family... If the same, the two families, where one family, the family boss, the family head, is extremely selfish. And family B, the family leader, family head, is extremely kind and very compassionate and loving. Which of the two family you think would be a happier family? One or two? Two. Okay. Which means that other cherishing. When it's other cherishing, the love and affection, happiness spreads. When selfishness is there, one person selfish, particularly the head of the, the family, is very selfish, the whole family will just split into, just break into pieces. Fragmented. So unhappy. You're getting it? So, they say real life incidents. For example, what happened was that that the Many years ago, there was. Uh, I was reading newspaper. In newspaper, it came out that there was one young man. He must be aged twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, and his motorbike 
his motorbike was just parked somewhere and a bus government bus happened to pass by and just hit it very lightly and made some scratch made and this young boy was extremely angry and he went to fight with the bus driver pulled down the bus driver beat him so badly and the bus driver was killed it came in the news okay so look how destroying the self-centered attitude is let us think of this these real stories then the naturally what happens the boy has to go behind the bars perhaps if not capital punishment for for sure the life imprisonment then what's the problem with your bike with your, your bike can be fixed in like two thousand three thousand rupees what is two thousand three thousand rupees nothing it's like maybe thirty fifty dollars fifty u s dollars it's nothing and then you just kill somebody and then what is the life what's the worth of this life of this person this person is the one who survives all her children the family whole family now whole family suffers how many pains they have to go through the loss of their father loss of the husband and so forth just think of that in your case what do you lose you 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 just have the scratch on a bike and then what do you lose that you end up in behind bars and the mother unfortunately the mother also said that beat him more and the mother also ended up in the behind bars so just common sense say behind bars actually you are very young you can you work for the next 30 40 50 years very easily you can earn like hundreds of thousands of yeah, hundreds of lakhs of rupees you can easily earn all these are gone you are behind bars you can do anything just to just because of the loss of 3000 rupees you just gave like millions of rupees you gave up the millions of rupees and you end up in behind bars where you, you feel more comfortable in prison or at home of course at home you cannot have the luxury to be at home for the next 40 50 years so if this boy when the boy was not in the rage of anger if you give him the choice in case if your bike is hit by another bus and i'll give you two choices one you can fight and kill the bus driver and you go behind bars and then you're all 40 50 years of possible potential income will all be gone you will not get it and your mother also behind bars one option another option is that you ask the driver okay fix this motorbike 4000 rupees is fine let us settle this problem these are two options what do you do when the boy is insane in a sanity instead of sanity what do you think the boy will choose which of two the boys the boy will choose huh just fix it and we do, we settle on this with no we no need no need to fight yes but when in the rage of anger your your sense of discrimination your sense of proper judgment your sense of wisdom is all gone and why this anger because of the selfishness you cannot think about the other person's family you cannot think about the other person's situation is all the selfishness that destroys others that destroys yourself that destroys your mother you're getting it this is the demerit of the selfishness in the family where there's a complication happen is because of the selfishness somewhere where the selfishness is there the family disharmony is happening on the international level where the selfishness is there wars happen you're getting it and it's not the common people why should the common people suffer because of the selfish leaders some of the selfish leaders extremely selfish they don't think about the repercussions of the miseries your citizens the common innocent citizens will have to go through how many thousands of thousands of people have been killed innocent people have been killed because of the say the say the total unwise decision taken by some of the leaders so the more we think about this the more we angry the more we, angry we become towards the selfishness so if you feel angry towards the selfishness what will you do you will try to run away from selfishness you're getting it yes
If you are, if you are very unhappy with the person A, what will you do? Huh? You will try to run away from this person A. And if the, you are in the same company, you will try to change the company. <laughs> right? Right? So like what? You want to run away from the selfishness. What is the best way to run away from selfishness? Huh? There's no person known as selfishness there. Selfishness is inside us. How to run away from it? Remove it. How to remove it? Introduce the counter force. You're getting it? Introduce the counter force. Okay, let's say that uh, say this is what it, it told you before. Same. If there is the the um say you want to read the book and it's totally dark, right? Oh, the spark cut, I want to read the book. Buddha, please remove the darkness. If you say this, what does the Buddha say? If the Buddha is sitting next to you, he'll be very upset. What a stupid follower. Right? If you light a candle, the Buddha will be so happy. This is a smart follower. Likewise, so to remove the darkness, you have to introduce the counterforce. Likewise, to remove the selfishness, you have to introduce the counterforce. What is the counterforce of selfishness? Other cherishing. <laughs> You're getting it? Cherish others. Selfish. You are cherishing others. Not for cherishing others, for to run away from selfishness, right? Because selfishness is the one which destroys you. I don't want some, somebody to destroy. I, want, I don't want somebody to control my life. Selfishness control my life. How to run away from this? By cherishing others. So when you cherish others, you don't feel, okay, how many feel tired of feeding yourself with breakfast? How many feel tired of feeding yourself with breakfast? And particularly the Jerisha, how many are you tired feeding yourself with uh, butter tea? No, why you like it, right? So, likewise, when you see that other cherishing, other cherishing gives me benefit. What benefit? That I can run away from the selfishness. You're getting it. It gives me benefit. When you see that it gives me benefit, pleasant feeling comes or unpleasant feeling comes. Pleasant feeling comes. Pleasant feeling boosts your energy. Pleasant feeling boosts your immunity. You're getting it? Pleasant feeling. Reli reliable pleasant feeling. This is the word. Reliable pleasant feeling with bo will boost your immunity. It will give you energy. It will not make you burn out. So when will you feel burn out? Say, okay, you help person A is helping. A person, a person A and B, they're helping person C. Person A feels that, I'm so glad that I, I get the opportunity to help you, person C. Person B says, I am helping you. <laughs> right? Person A says what? I'm so glad I get the opportunity to help you, person C. And person B says, I am helping you. Right? And which of the two persons will feel burnout out quicker? A or B? B, because the person does not find joy in helping person C. Person A feels joy. Where there's a joy, you will not feel burnout. You're getting it? Therefore, uh, step number four and five, they are the tone and practice. That I take the suffering of others, give happiness to others. If there's no joy, you'll feel burnout. You're getting it? Okay, we'll stop here. Eta om gati gati ara gati ara sam gati bhati swaha Eta om gati gati ara gati Parasam gati bodhi svatyatam Om gati gati Paragati Parasam gati bodhi svaha Page 52 Dedication prayer. I dedicate the matter to Das Gathat towards the realization that is in the prayers 
of Buddhism, Bodhisattvas, the three times, and to the holding of the doctrine and scripture inside, may in all lives, through the force of this merit, never separate from four wheels of mind a vehicle, and accomplish all the stages of the path, renunciation, bodhicitta, perfume in the two stages. From my two collections, vast space that have amassed from working with effort at this practice for a great length of time, may I become the chief leading Buddha for all those whose minds are victimized by blind ignorance. Okay, three processions together. <clears throat> 